This is Space Time, Series 23, Episode 13. Coming up on Space Time. The giant galactic structure hiding nearby in plain sight. New estimates for the age of the Milky Way. And new evidence of a phenomenon known as frame dragging shows that Albert Einstein was right again. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. Astronomers have discovered a massive wave of interconnected stellar nurseries forming what's one of the largest coherent structures in the Milky Way galaxy. This spectacular feature is some 9,000 light-years long, 400 light-years wide, and cresting some 500 light-years above and below the plane of the galaxy's disk. The monolithic structure has been named the Radcliffe Wave, after the author's home base, the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study at Harvard University. A report in the journal Nature claims the structure is located only about 500 light-years from the Sun, surprisingly close to our solar system, given that it's only just been discovered. The authors were using data gathered by the European Space Agency's Gaia spacecraft, together with other space and ground-based observations, to create a new three-dimensional map of interstellar matter in the Milky Way when they noticed an unexpected pattern in the Orion spiral arm closest to the Earth. Gaia was launched in 2013 on a mission to precisely measure the position, distance and motion of more than a billion stars in our galactic neighbourhood. One of the study's authors, Elisa Goodman, says no one expected to find that we live next to a giant wave-like collection of gas, or that it forms a significant part of the local arm of the Milky Way. She says the team was completely shocked when they first realised how long and straight the Radcliffe was when looked down from above in 3D, but at the same time, how sinuous it looked when viewed from Earth. The wave's very existence is forcing astronomers to rethink their understanding of the Milky Way's three-dimensional structure. Importantly, the findings also overturned Gould's Belt, a 150-year-old hypothesis suggesting the existence of an expanding, undulating ring of star-forming filaments believed to be oriented around the Sun. For a long time, scientists were trying to figure out whether these molecular clouds of gas and dust actually formed a ring in three dimensions. Instead, they've discovered the largest coherent gas structure known in the galaxy. And the data suggests that the Sun, and consequently our solar system, has interacted with this structure, passing by a festival of supernovae as it crossed Orion some 13 million years ago. And in another 13 million years, it will cross the structure again, sort of like surfing the wave. You're listening to Space Time. Coming up next, a new estimate for the age of the Milky Way, and later, new evidence of frame dragging shows Einstein was right. What else did you expect? All that and more coming up on Space Time. (music) Astronomers have determined that one of the Milky Way galaxy's primary structures, its thick disk, is about 10 billion years old. The findings, reported in the Journal of the Monthly Notices of the Royal Astronomical Society and on the pre-press physics website archive.org, help solve an astronomical mystery which has been perplexing scientists for decades. A vertical cross-section of the Milky Way spiral arms showed that they're actually composed of two disc-like structures, known as the thick and thin disks. The thick disk contains about 20% of the galaxy's stars and, based on its vertical puffiness and composition, is thought to be the older of the pair. The problem is earlier data about the age distribution of stars in the disk didn't agree with the models constructed to describe it. And no one knew where the error lay. Was it in the data or in the models? The study's lead author, Dr. Sanjeev Sharma from the University of Sydney, says a fresh analysis has revealed that the chemical composition used for the existing models for the stars in the thick disk was wrong, which has impacted on their age estimates. Sharma and colleagues reached their conclusions by using data from NASA's planet-hunting Kepler Space Telescope. Kepler searched for planets by looking at a section of the sky for dips in the light coming from distant stars. Those dips being caused by orbiting planets passing in front of them and blocking out some of their starlight as seen from Kepler. Sharma and colleagues used the Kepler data not to search for planets, but to study oscillations in the stars themselves caused by starquakes. The quakes are generated by convection, turbulence and magnetic fields in the stars, producing acoustic waves which make the star ring or vibrate like a bell. 
Kepler can see these sound waves as subtle changes in a star's light. The technique, known as astroseismology, uses the frequencies of these vibrations to provide insights into a star's internal properties, including its age. It's a bit like identifying a violin as a Stradivarius or Meistergeiger by listening to the sound it makes. The age dating allowed the authors to essentially look back in time and discern the period in the universe's history when the galaxy was formed, a practice known as galactic archaeology. But the data delivered by Kepler presented a problem, suggesting there were more young stars in the thick disk than what the models had predicted. So the question confronting scientists was fairly stark. Were the models wrong, or was the data incomplete? Then in 2013, Kepler broke down, and NASA was forced to reprogram it to continue working on reduced capacity, a period which became known as the Kepler-2 or K-2 mission. The project involved observing many different parts of the sky for 80 days at a time, and the first batch of new data from these observations represented a rich source for Shah and colleagues. A fresh spectroscopic analysis revealed that the chemical composition incorporated in the existing models for the stars in the thick disk was wrong, and that would have affected the prediction of the stars' ages. Sharma says taking the new estimates into account brought the observed astroseismic data into agreement with the model predictions. If you look at not only the Milky Way but also other galaxies, what you see is there are kind of two components. One is a puffier one, which we call the thick disk, and another is slightly thinner, called the thin disk. And we also know like the stars are older in the thick disk and they are younger, so they also have different composition. And this is also seen in other galaxies. Yeah, so some galaxies do exhibit this kind of dual behavior. Where are we in, in the Milky Way? Are we in the thick or thin disk? We are in the thin disk. We are very close to the mid-plane of the galaxy. We are about 20 parsecs away from the mid-plane, and the thick the thick the thickness of the disk is something like one to two kiloparsecs, to, to just give you an idea. Thin disk is it's related to the, the height of the disk, right? So if you think like in units of two units is the thickness of the thick disk, and we are like two kilo units, I was saying, and we are like 20 just there, right? Out of 2,000, we are only 20 up from the mid-plane. So we're very close to the, to the mid-plane of the disk. There's always been this debate about the actual age of the thick disk, and this is what you were trying to resolve. Yeah, because uh, one of the things you want to know is why do we have this thick and thin disk? What's the origin of this, right? And there are various theories about how the thick disk formed. For example, it's thought that uh, maybe the disk was puffier to begin with at earlier times because it's older. Or the other thing was over time due to interaction with other satellites that accreted with the Milky Way that it got heated up due to collisions and so on. And, and things like this. So, so there are various theories as to what might have formed the thick disk. But to know that, for example, if you don't know the age, you can't date back. For example, if you knew there was a collision in the Milky Way 11 billion years ago, then you need to know when the thick disk was formed to see if the thick disk was actually formed with a collision or, or not, right? So things like this. It's very important to know what's the age if you want to understand the evolution. And that's what you were trying to resolve. Yeah. Tell me about that. So, so we're trying to understand the age of age and evolution of the Milky Way and to know the age of the stars, to piece together the puzzle of its formation. And when the initial Kepler mission was launched, we thought we were very excited that probably we can measure the age of giant stars with it. And we got the data, but when we compared that with the models, what we found was there was a discrepancy that the data, if you look at the age distribution of stars that were observed by the Kepler, they were very youngish, while the models predicted they should be more older stars. And so that led us to think, uh, is our models wrong or is there something peculiar about the data? And for a long time, we couldn't resolve that. And one of the reasons was the Kepler wasn't designed to study the galaxy. It was designed to study exo exoplanets. So it's like asking a question, if you want to say, what is the age distribution of people in Sydney, for example, right? Then if you take a data near the school, obviously it will be biased towards seeing more children, right? So in the same way, how the data was collected, it was not clear and it was not possible to piece together that puzzle. But when the K2 mission came, like one of the reaction wheels of Kepler died, and they repurposed the mission because it couldn't point in the same direction for a long time. So it, a new mission called K2 came up, where for 90 days it would observe each region of the galaxy. And with K2, we could sample more regions of the galaxy, unlike Kepler, and we actually designed the selection function so that we exactly know which kind of stars we are serving, so at least that problem won't be there. And interestingly, what turned out was we found 
that it was a, some problem with the metallicity that we were using in our model for all the stars specifically. So this is the chemical composition of the stars themselves. Yeah. Stars, the universe yeah. started out all hydrogen and helium, and as stars yeah. evolve and die and new stars form out of the remains of those, the metals, yeah. that is all the elements other than hydrogen and helium, the amount yeah. of these metals increases. And that lets you know the age of the formation of those stars, when those stars were born. Yeah, age of when the stars were born. Yes, yeah. that's what we're talking about. And so what K2 offered was we were observing, so like, like I said, Kepler was mostly observing stars in the plane. So we didn't have that many old stars in Kepler. And the thick disk is old, right? We need to observe more older stars, which are a little bit above the plane. But K2 was observing different regions of the galaxy because of the way the mission was designed, right? It, was, it couldn't steer in one direction for a long time. But this offered us the opportunity to actually sample more older stars. And the other thing was in Australia, we were doing a spectroscopic follow-up of these stars also. So we observe the spectra of the stars, and that allows you to measure these uh, metal lines. For example, everything heavier than hydrogen or helium, for example, iron, nickel, and so on and so forth. So with that spectroscopic data from Australia, which we were collecting, when we pieced together these two, what we found was, well, the metallicity distribution is also not agreeing with the model. So then we revised the model to have more correct metallicity for the stars in the model. And then we found that, yeah, it explains the astroseismic data observed by K2. And then also it improved our agreement for the Kepler stars. But, but it was mainly K2 because we got these more older stars that we could figure out these puzzles, right? Um, yeah. And so you were talking about astro seismic data. This is the vibrations that are yeah. made by stars through various internal machinations. Tell me about that. Yeah. So, so one of the problems is age of a star is so important, but it's very difficult to measure it. There's no direct way. Like, for example, you want to measure the luminosity or something. You can just measure, take some data, collect how many photons you're receiving. You can do that. But age, you can't do that. It has to be inferred indirectly by using other things. And the red giant stars are unique in this way because the light of the star fluctuates very slightly over time. And this is what we call quakes. It's like vibrations of the of the star in some ways. And those vibrations lead to dimness and increase slowly the intensity of the light changes, right? If you observe it over a longer time. And by observing this, you can identify in which modes the star is oscillating, just like if you have an organ pipe or a musical instrument, say, vibrate at particular frequencies. In the same way, stars also vibrate at particular frequencies. And you can get that from a spacecraft like Kepler or K2, which was designed to do exoplanets. But the idea is you want to get a time series observation of a star, like as a function of time, how is the light from the star changing? Is it constant or is it changing over time in a periodic fashion? This is known as astroseismology. And if you get that data, then for red giant stars, it happens that you can measure the mass of the star from that. And mass is in some ways related to age, so you can indirectly infer the age. So that is what was crucial or unique about Kepler and K2, that it allowed us to measure the age of large sample of stars. And once you have the age, you can piece together how the galaxy was formed and so on and so forth. So that, so that is the role of astroseismology here. Okay, now you've got some data. What are you going to do with it now? I'm right now also analyzing the more because this data only used data from first four campaigns, and we now have data from uh, about 10 more campaigns. And my preliminary analysis shows that the results are the same, like it's just adding more uh, evidence to what I presented in the paper. But we are looking at more detail now that we understand this effect and the models, we know what was wrong in the model. Now we are using also other spectroscopic data to piece together a much more accurate model of the galaxy. Uh, the test uh, results are also going to come sometime next year. People are already analyzing the data from tests, which is a mission similar to Kepler, but it's observing more bright stars. Will this research tell us how the, um, the spiral arms themselves were formed and exactly what their function is in terms of star formation? The so spiral arms are generally made of young stars, right? So thick disk, for example, doesn't have spiral arms. The spiral arms are all maybe stars in a few giga years, but they are very important because spiral arms play a critical role in redistributing the stars from where they were born. So if the stars were born at a certain circle and they keep on orbiting in the same circle, then it's very easy for us. We can piece together exactly the history, but that's not the case. Stars move away from where they were born, and this complicates things. Like you don't know where they came from or where their origin was, so you have to use a lot of more data to infer things. The spiral arms play a critical role in that because it's, then the galaxy is not axisymmetric, right? So there is a it breaks the symmetry of the galaxy, and due to that, 
think stars can migrate inwards or outwards from where they were born, and they mix stars up. They also, to so think this probably is like a process because the puffiness of the disk is related to how heated the stars are, like how much random motion the stars have. And over the time, spiral arms actually induce random motion into stars. That's what makes the thick the disk puffier. So they play a critical role. And yeah, data like this, if you can piece together all the puzzles, it will help us understand uh, what spiral arms do and how they migrate stars. And the overall evolution of the Milky Way. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's Dr. Sanjeev Sharma from the University of Sydney, and this is Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. Astronomers tracking the orbit of an exotic binary star system have discovered new evidence of frame dragging, the process by which the rotation of a massive celestial object can cause the very fabric of space time to twist. The findings, reported in the journal Science, is further evidence for the accuracy of Albert Einstein's general theory of relativity. Put simply, it states that gravity rises from the curvature of space-time, and that objects such as the Sun and the Earth can change its geometry. In 1999, astronomers using the CSIRO's 64-metre Parkes radio telescope began observing two stars orbiting each other at astonishing speeds. The system was named PSR J1141-6545 and is located close to the Southern Cross in the southern constellation of Musca the Fly. It consists of a white dwarf, the exposed white-hot stellar core of a long-dead sun-like star. It has about the same diameter as the Earth, but it's far more massive, some 300,000 times as dense. Its binary companion is even more interesting. It's a radio pulsar, that is a fast-rotating neutron star, the stellar corpse of a star that was far more massive than the Sun, which ended its life in a spectacular supernova. The explosion so powerful, it briefly outshone the entire galaxy. Neutron stars are tiny, just 20 to 30 kilometers in diameter, but other than black holes, they're the densest objects in the universe. In fact, the average neutron star has more than 100 billion times the density of the Earth. The two stellar remnants orbit each other every five hours. The study's lead author, Vivek Venkaranan Krishman from the Max Planck Institute, says the pulsar's orbit is very special. It hurtles through space with a maximum speed of almost a million kilometres per hour. And the maximum separation between the two stars is barely larger than our sun. Unlike other pulsar white dwarf binary systems, models suggest that the white dwarf companion to this pulsar formed before the pulsar did. Now, an important prediction in stellar evolution is that before the supernova explosion that formed the pulsar occurred one and a half million years ago, its progenitor star began expanding out into a red supergiant. And because the pair were so close in their orbit, some of the red supergiant's outer gaseous envelope was gravitationally drawn under the nearby white dwarf. And this caused an enormous acceleration in the white dwarf's rotation. And here's where things get really interesting. An important consequence of general relativity is that all rotating bodies should drag the fabric of space-time around with them. Now, in everyday life, the effect's minuscule and almost undetectable. But what about at cosmic scales? In 1918, three years after Dr. Einstein published his theory, Austrian mathematicians Josef Lenz and Hans Thuring, with substantial support from Einstein, calculated this effect for the solar system using general relativity. In particular, they calculated how the dragging of space-time caused by the rotation of our Sun would influence the movement of the planets. Sadly, they found that these effects were too impossibly small to measure at the time. Of course, over the years, technology has progressed somewhat, and the frame-dragging effect of Earth's rotation, a body considerably smaller than the Sun, was eventually detected by satellite experiments such as Gravity Probe B and the laser ranging satellites LARS and LEGEOS 1 and 2. Gravity Probe B used a set of four precision gyroscopes to measure this effect, finding that the gyroscope's orientation was dragged into the direction of the Earth's spin. And the laser-ranging satellite experiments also measured a slow precession of the orbital plane of the satellites in the direction of Earth's rotation, the so-called lens steering precession. Now, the effect is still extremely small. The GEOS-1, for example, is in a circular orbit with a radius of approximately 12,300 kilometres and its orbital plane processes only by about 0.0000086 degrees per year. That corresponds to a full rotation every 40 million years. Of course, a rapidly spinning white dwarf, like the one in PSR J1141-6545, 
drag space-time a hundred million times more strongly. So, a neutron star in orbit around such a white dwarf presents a unique opportunity to explore Einstein's theory in a new ultra-relativistic regime. So, the authors measured the radio signals coming from the pulsar, which provide a precise measurement of its motions, similar to the satellite laser ranging measurements. With the help of atomic clocks, the authors were able to perform highly accurate measurements of the arrival times of the pulsar signals. They could track the pulsar in its orbit with an average ranging precision of about 30 kilometers per measurement over a period of almost 20 years, giving them a precise determination of the size and orientation of the orbit. Now, at that distance of the pulsar from the white dwarf, the dragging of space-time is about a million times weaker than at the distance of the Ligeus one like orbit. However, the authors were able to show a precession in the pulsar's path of about 150 kilometers over the 20 years of observations. Kirshen says being able to measure the arrival times of the pulses to within 100 microseconds over nearly 20 years is what allowed for the identification of a long-term drift in the orbital parameters. 20 years ago, the CSIRO Parkes Radio Telescope discovered a unique gravitational laboratory over 10,000 light-years away in the constellation Musca. The system comprised of a white dwarf, a few hundred thousand times the mass and density of the Earth, and an exotic neutron star in the form of a pulsar locked in a tight five-hour orbit. Our team has been mapping the orbit of the pulsar in a series of campaigns since the early 2000s. We found that not only is the pulsar's orbit shrinking because of the emission of gravitational waves, its entire orbit was also tumbling in space. But why? A century ago, Austrian physicists Lenz and Thuring realised that if Einstein was right, All rotating bodies drag the very fabric of space-time around with them, but the effects are usually too small to measure. In our system, the rapidly spinning white dwarf drags space-time 100 million times more strongly than the Earth would, causing the entire orbit to tumble in space. This is space-time. Still to come, Rocket Lab launches an American spy satellite, and later in the science report, a new study has confirmed a significant link between eating meat and heart disease. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Rocket Lab has successfully launched the new top-secret spy satellite for America's National Reconnaissance Office. The NROL-151 spacecraft was launched aboard an electron rocket from Rocket Lab's Mahia launch complex on the New Zealand North Island's east coast. The launch had been delayed by high ground-level winds. Eight, seven. Six, five, four, ignition, three, two, one. And we're off the pad into flight for the 11th electron mission. In approximately 30 seconds, the rocket will reach the point of maximum aerodynamic pressure on its way to space. High voltage battery discharge nominal. Electron is supersonic. Approaching max Q. An electron has cleared max Q. Next up is a series of mission milestones which occur in quick succession. Coming up first is main engine cutoff, or MECO, followed shortly by the booster's separation from the rest of the vehicle. Speed is one kilometer per second. Altitude is 26 kilometers. AOS at Chatham Station. Stage one propulsion remains nominal. Electrons Rutherford engines are continuing nominally on the way to orbit. Our speed is currently 4,800 kilometers per hour, and our altitude is 45 kilometers as we approach main engine cutoff. Stage one, MECO. There you have it. We've had successful Miko and Electron's first and second stages have separated cleanly. The first stage begins its descent, and we should see jettison of Electron's fairing very shortly. Separating fairing. And there it is. The fairing has separated clearly away for payload deployment. The Electron's Curry kick stage successfully deployed the satellite into a 590 to 610 kilometer high elliptical transfer orbit 50 minutes into the flight. The Electron rocket used for the flight was also fitted with equipment to test plans to recover the boosters for reuse. Rocket Lab's previous Electron launch in December successfully guided the spent first stage booster back down in a controlled descent. And the company has now repeated that manoeuvre on its latest launch, using the booster's thrusters to flip the Electron around 180 degrees, re-entering the atmosphere oriented vertically to better withstand the heat and pressure of atmospheric re-entry. The booster was also fitted with updated guidance and navigation systems, including S-band telemetry and onboard flight computers to gather and transmit data throughout the booster's descent. Future missions will add parachutes to the booster, with a helicopter then used to grab the parachute suspension lines and pluck the booster out of the air during descent. This mission, called Birds of a Feather, was Rocket Lab's first launch for the year, 
and the 11th flight for the two-stage Electron rocket. After six successful launches last year, Rocket Lab's now planning to fly a mission at least once a month during 2020. And as part of that effort, the company's just opened a new launch complex at NASA's Wallops Island Flight Facility on the Virginian Mid-Atlantic Coast. Well, Russia and China have had them for years, and the United States has just set up its own. Now, the Australian Strategic Policy Unit says the Australian Defence Force needs to establish its own space command within the Air Force. Senior analyst Malcolm Davis says while the ADF doesn't need a space force, it does need to recognise space as an operational domain in its own right, just like land, sea, air and cyber. Writing in the Canberra Times, Davis says the ADF needs a space command within the Air Force in which space operations, doctrines and capability developments are managed by space professionals. He says the creation of the United States Space Force by the Trump administration raises new opportunities for Australia to develop its own space capabilities to pursue tighter cooperation and integration with the US and the other Five Eyes partners in space. He points out that the Australian military has a strong reliance on space for communications, surveillance and navigation, not just for troops and transport, but also for the guiding and timing functions for the command and control of weapons. This is Space Time. And time now to take a brief look at some of the other stories making news in science this week with a science report. A new study has confirmed a significant link between eating meat and heart disease. The findings, reported in the Journal of the American Medical Association, show that consuming more meat, including chicken but not fish, as well as processed meats, was associated with an increased risk of heart disease. The authors also found that both processed and unprocessed red meat consumption was significantly associated with a small increase in the risk of death from all causes. The research examined the findings of six dietary intake and health outcome data studies involving some 30,000 adult participants over 24 years, with baseline assessments between 1985 and 2002. The authors suggest that their findings warrant further investigation into the public health implications of current diets. A new study is warning that rare snubfin dolphins in Queensland's Fitzroy River, as well as humpback dolphins in Port Curtis, are under threat from exposure to increasing amounts of water contamination. The research, published in the journal Ecological Indicators, sampled pollutants in the blubber and skin of humpback and snub-nosed dolphins in the Fitzroy River and Port Curtis between 2014 and 2016. The results were then compared with earlier samples collected between 2009 and 2010. They found that in only five years, the concentrations of PCBs, DDTs and HCBs in both species had increased by a staggering two to seven times. Well, it won't tackle global carbon emissions just yet, but new technology from the CSIRO has found a way to pull carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and put it into beer and other beverages. Amazingly, while carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere have been increasing dramatically, there have been shortages of industrial supplies of the gas for more than a decade, impacting on beverage and food production. And that's where this new technology called Athena comes in. It uses new filtration methods to capture carbon dioxide directly from the air through the use of tiny sponges called metal organic frameworks. The existing Athena setup is capable of capturing two tons of carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere in a year. Engineers say it's cost-effective, requiring only air and electricity to work, and it can be used on-site, on-demand, and provide a reliable source of carbon dioxide for use in small-scale applications ranging from beverage carbonation to controlling pH in swimming pools, industrial cleaning, and could even be a valuable source for the chemical industry. Archaeologists say an ancient temple at a dig site outside Jerusalem could provide a glimpse of what the great Temple of King Solomon was like. Known as the Tel Moza Temple, the structure dates back some 3,000 years. A report in the Biblical Archaeology Review found that the excavation showed that the Tel Moza Temple's architectural plan and decorations are similar to those of Solomon's Temple in Jerusalem, as described in the Book of Kings 1, Chapter 6. It includes a monumental temple complex, with a high altar alongside which was a table and ritual utensils and clay figurines. There are also dozens of storerooms or silos and two large grain storage facilities. In archaeology, the design has become generally known as the North Syrian Temple type. The findings show that the site was an important economic and administrative centre for the fertile Mosa Valley. 
Archaeologists from Tel Aviv University have been excavating the temple complex, which is the only one of its kind known to date from the time of the kingdoms of Israel and Judah. The excavations therefore contribute to science's understanding of the first temple period, allowing researchers to compare the archaeological findings with the biblical narrative. Built on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem, Solomon's Temple was destroyed by the Babylonian King Nebuchadnezzar in 586 BCE to punish the Jews for the siege of Jerusalem. As he conquered the Jews and sacked Jerusalem, Nebuchadnezzar also exiled most senior community members to captivity in Babylon. Then in 516 BCE, the Persian king Darius allowed the Jews to return to their homeland and rebuild the temple on the Temple Mount. This second temple was subsequently refurbished and expanded over a 10-year period from around 20 BCE under the rule of Herod, the Roman client king of Judea. However, it turned out to be a case of history repeating itself. It was destroyed by the Romans in the year 70, this time as punishment for a Jewish revolt against Roman rule, and the Jews were again exiled from their homeland, with the Roman Emperor Hadrian also changing the land's name from Judea to Syria-Palestina. The only significant remains left off the Second Temple is the Western or Wailing Wall, the Kotel, the holiest place in Judaism. Anstow and the University of Melbourne have developed a new method of providing age estimates for Aboriginal rock art. The ancient art is thousands of years old, but most doesn't contain carbon, and so it can't be accurately carbon dated. The new technique relies on the humble mud wasp, These little insects construct nests which build up on the ancient rock art paintings in Western Australia's remote Kimberley region. In fact, the nests are commonly found in rock shelters across all of Northern Australia and can survive for tens of thousands of years. Importantly, they contain tiny amounts of carbon, mostly in the form of charcoal from bushfires. And of course, the carbon can be radiocarbon dated, meaning the age of any directly adjoining rock artwork can be determined. In fact, scientists have already used the technique to determine the age of 108 rock art sites, finding them to be around 12,000 years old. And that's the show for now. You can subscribe and download Space Time as a free twice-weekly podcast through Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Bytes.com, Pocket Casts, SoundCloud, YouTube, Audioboom, from SpaceTimeWithStuartGary.com, or from your favourite podcast download provider. If you want more space time, check out our blog, where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as loads of images, news stories, videos, and things on the web that I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word and in lowercase, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us through at Stuart Gary on Twitter, at Spacetime with Stuart Gary on Instagram, on Facebook, just go to www.facebook.com slash Spacetime with Stuart Gary, and you can also find us on the Spacetime with Stuart Gary YouTube channel. Spacetime is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Spacetime with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. Bytes.com.